pleased to now to introduce John Wakeley, uh, who's one of the speakers and lecturers in our population genetics course. And so most of you already know John, but for those who have just joined us from ICTS, uh, it'll be nice to for them to know who they're uh, listening to. So John currently heads the Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology at Harvard University, and he has been working on trying to understand um, the patterns of genetic variation that we see in populations and individuals across genes and across genomes, uh, and trying to understand these patterns using coalescent theory, about which he uh, started teaching us today. Um, and, and even though this sort of sounds, and I think perhaps John's abstract and title sounds a little bit scary for people who aren't com comfortable thinking about coalescent theory, but the basic idea is that you have these uh, patterns of variation and you want to use basic mathematical models and more complicated models to understand how can we infer the history of the population, such as when did it go through bottlenecks, what kind of bottlenecks did it go through, what is the history, for instance, of human populations or HIV uh, populations, which is things that he's worked on in the recent past. Um, what's also interesting is John teaches a freshman seminar series on evolution, Buddhism, and ethics. Um, and I think this sort of speaks to his uh, broad interests and his interests in communicating um, what he does and his work, as well as others' work in evolution to many, many different kinds of people. So we're happy to have John speak to us about coalescent gene genealogy. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate the chance to give you a little lecture about some recent work that we've been doing in my group. And I just want to mention right before starting two graduate students who contributed to what I'll talk about this hour. And they are Leandra King and Peter Wilton, who are two current students of mine. Um, so I want to talk about the coalescent theory, but incorporating something that had not been part of the theory um, until recently. And it is the pedigree, or the re reproductive relationships in a population. This was something that has been ignored in the field. Um, and I have just been working on incorporating it into coalescence and wondering whether it or not it makes a difference. And here's a kind of outline of what I will talk about. I'm going to talk a little bit at the introduction about sources of randomness in models in population genetics and make reference to models that look forward in time, diffusion models, and coalescent models which look backward in time. The point being that they're basically the same model, looked at two different ways. Then I'll introduce the idea of the population pedigree and show you some simulation results. Uh, these are mostly simulation results, but I'll, they're all simulation results that I'll talk to you about today, um, of coalescence within pedigrees. And then I will, uh, the conclusion of that middle bit is mostly that in a large, well-mixed population, it actually doesn't matter that individuals are related by a pedigree and we ignore it most of the time for a large population. So the last part of the talk will investigate some situations in which the pedigree can have a significant influence potentially on genetic data across a genome. Okay. And I'll explain these things as I go. I'm going to look in particular at very large families in a pedigree, uh, selective sweeps that sweep through a pedigree, and also subdivision and migration. So just to give a little. Uh, introduction to this field, which I, I work in and you're all becoming members of, um, population genetics, our goal is to understand the forces that produce and maintain genetic variation, mostly within populations or within species, sometimes between uh, populations and species. For this, we go out and you know, do empirical work, measure DNA variation or other kinds of variation, but we also develop mathematical models that help aid our understanding working out what kind of factors conspire to shape genetic variation within populations. And using those same models in a statistical setting, we want to take the data and then make some inferences about what has happened in the population, the factors that go into producing and maintaining genetic variation. There are a number of places in a life cycle or in a population process in which there are random factors. And we incorporate these into our models that try to predict genetic variation. One point is the actual movement of individuals, survival of an individual, movement and reproduction, finding a mate and reproducing or not, 
this happens in all species, of course. But I claim we know almost nothing about it for most species. And at the level one would like to make a really detailed mathematical model. Nonetheless, ultimately what these things do all together is lay down what I'll call the population pedigree. And this is just a list of all of the reproductive relationships in a population. So it's me and my two parents and my four grandparents and same with all of you and same with all the people in the entire human species. Can you imagine following that thing, or our family tree, backward in time for a very long period of time? This is the object I'll call the population pedigree. And it's within this pedigree that genes are passed, right? Mendelian inheritance happens within our pedigree. And I have some chromosomes here because they filtered down through this huge object. And I wanna sort of, I wanna take that into account and in particular, what I would like to do is sort of ignore all of those complicated factors, which we don't know a whole lot about, and just condition on the pedigree. Because the population pedigree really is something that happens. It's fixed. In particular, for all the loci in the genome, they filtered through the same pedigree. Another point at which uh, there is randomness in, in genetics and population genetics is in genetic transmission. So Mendel's laws are kind of a classic example of a stochastic process which has been verified and understood in great detail for many, many decades. This goes into the model and is well justified. There's another point at which things are stochastic and that is when mutation happens. Mutations happen at um, particular sites, but it's very difficult to predict when a mutation happens, which site it will happen at, or when it's going to happen. These things appear very much random, unpredictable. And I'll just note in passing also that the mutation rates are very small in, in most species. The questions I would like to address in this talk are really two. The first one is how much different are the predictions of transmission within a pedigree from the predictions of standard models which ignore pedigree? And then what kinds of demographic events structure population pedigrees in such a way that the predictions are very different than the standard predictions? <clears throat> what I call the standard population genetic models in this, uh, in this talk are ones like this. So we take those factors that I've talked about and we put them into the model. And often it'll look something like what's on this slide. Um, very simple. Uh, we assume, often assume a very simple situation of a haploid organism. And if we're dealing with diploids, we'll do something tricky, which is to assume that there's a one mating type and random mating. And in that case, the diploid model is equivalent to a haploid model. Um, we assume typically a single well-mixed or randomly mating, if we're talking about diploids, a population like that, uh, that is of large size n, often assumed to be constant. And at the very start, you know, the null models of population genetics assume that all genetic variation is neutral. So this gives you kind of a background prediction for what you'd expect when there's nothing else going on. No selection, no migration, and what. This kind of model is the basis for a lot of population genetics. And it goes in particular into um, the diffusion theory, which is the heart of classical population genetics, or, or at least a, a major part of it, that Wright, Fisher, and Kimura developed. And it also goes into the coalescent theory, which is basically my field that I study. And it was um, something that Kingman, Hudson, Tajima, and others developed in the 80s. The coalescent looks backward in time, whereas these diffusion models and classical models of, of population genetics, they go forward in time. Here's an example of the kind of data that one could think about applying a forward time population genetic model to. Burry, uh, in the 1950s, 1956, published these experiments in Drosophila. And so what Burry did is in a laboratory, he created independent populations, 107 of them, and started each of them with a frequency of one half for a visible mutant where he could actually count the heterozygotes and the homozygotes for this mutant. And so he ran these populations forward in time in the lab. And what he did is each generation randomly selected um, eight males and eight females. 
for a total population size of 16. And he did that at random within each population every 10 years. And he ran this over, over 19 generations. And there's a table in his paper that I put into a, a, a data file and made this histogram. So I, I'm not showing the very beginning um, of the experiment where 100% of these populations or proportion 1 would be on frequency 0.5. Frequency 0.5, uh, well, the count of alleles would be 16 because there are uh, 16 diploid individuals, so 32 possible alleles within each of these populations. And they would start out with 16. And then as the experiment goes forward in time, the allele frequencies shift because of genetic drift that is exerted by this sampling of 16 individuals every generation. And what you can see from the figure is that the populations start moving around. And eventually, some of them start fixing on the boundary. So some of them will lose one of the alleles at some generation. And because there's not enough time for any mutations to happen in this experiment, they'll stay there. Right? So slowly, we'll accumulate fixed populations. And there should be about 50% of each of them because this is a neutral genetic marker. And that's what happens. And then in the middle, you know, toward the end of the experiment, there's a somewhat flat-looking surface there of populations that are still segregating this allele, these two alleles. And over on the right-hand side of this graph are predictions of single locus diffusion theory about the, a future of one population. So the way a, a classical population genetic model works, or a diffusion model, is that you have start with a frequency p, in this case uh, 0.5, and you predict forward in time a probability function, a distribution over the frequency of where it will be at some future time. And these are the appropriate kind of data to compare a theoretical prediction like that to, because that's what really happened. I did many replicates, and now I've got a distribution of outcomes. right? And that's what it, the theory predicts, a distribution of outcomes. And that's what this particular experiment did. So it's a really appropriate uh, case of application of forward time diffusion theory. One, uh, well, you can see, first of all, that roughly speaking, the model really does predict basically what happened in the experiment. One little glitch or interesting thing, depending on how you look at it, is that the, uh, I, I made this graph here. And the way that I had to do it is I had to fiddle with the population size in my diffusion model until it fit the number of populations that fix by the end of the experiment. And I had to make the effective population size smaller, equal to nine diploid individuals instead of 16, in order to get the uh, fit that you see here. And, and this is explained typically by saying something like, the model assumes um, a Poisson number of offspring of every individual, roughly. Whereas over here, uh, in truth, there's a greater variance in offspring among individuals within these populations. and so. Drift happens faster, and the effective population size is smaller. But in any case, the theory and the experiment fit each other well here, and it's appropriate, right? It really is a, an appropriate use of the theoretical model. Uh, here is an introduction to the standard coalescent model that um, is the basis of coalescent theory. So the idea is that we sample um, some individual sequences now. There are nine of them in this picture, I think. And then we follow them backward in time. And what the models do is make a prediction about the genetic ancestry of the sample, that it's some tree like this. And we're able to predict a distribution of these trees, both in their shape of branching and in the times, uh, the these times during which there are different numbers of lineages in the sample. And so the, the basis of the coalescent model, and this is the same thing that happens in a diffusion model, is you imagine that the population size is very, very large. And to do the math, you take a limit. But the idea is that you develop a model that is an approximation to what happens in a very large population, large finite population. Time is rescaled in these kinds of models in terms of two NE generations. And when that is done and this limit is taken, we get a distribution, an exponential distribution for each of these intercoalescent intervals in the tree. We also find for a neutral model that it's a random joining tree. And then finally, when we're putting mutations back into the picture, this is a neutral model. 
Um, we can separate the mutation process from the genealogical process. We can scatter mutations on these trees randomly. They happen along each lineage with this rate, a mutation rate of theta over two. So this is a, just a description of the underlying coalescent model that people developed in the 1980s. And the typical sort of uh, application of this kind of model today is like here. Um, and this is uh, something I mentioned in uh, the, the course. Um, some data from humans where what they did is sequence little stretches of DNA and compare two of them. And they're roughly 500 base pairs long. And they counted numbers of differences between those two and then put it in a table. And they did that about 12,000 times. And 8,796 of them had no difference, right? And 2,247 had one difference, and, and so on, up to four differences in about 500 base pairs. <clears throat> this is a, ta a, a table from this paper of the International Sit Sitmap Working Group uh, from 2001. And what they did in the paper is, is compare that observed distribution to two predictions. One is a Poisson distribution. The Poisson distribution, you can see, doesn't fit particularly well. It's got too few zeros, and it's got too few uh, fours by quite a bit. And they did another, uh, another model. Instead of the Poisson, they used the coalescent model that I just described. And you can see the coalescent model does better. Right? It has something close to the observed numbers of zeros, one, two, threes. Maybe it's a little shy once you get up to the four category. But it's a lot better than the Poisson distribution. This Poisson distribution would be the right distribution whoops, if all of the loci in the human genome had the same time to the common ancestor, the same opportunity for mutation. But in fact, they don't. And so here's how a coalescent model would, would be used in this case. We would uh, use the coalescent result to describe the distribution of coalescence times among loci in the genome. This is a key thing, among loci in the genome. So in generating some fake data, for example, we would sample a time from this exponential distribution, and then we would put mutations on it. And if the time happened to be um, long, and there would be more opportunity for mutations. And if it happened to be short, there would be less opportunity for mutation. And so the interpretation of the fact that the coalescent fits better to the genetic data is that actually times to common ancestry uh, are different across the human genome. And the coalescent model incor incorporates that and captures it significantly enough that it is much better than the Poisson prediction. There's a problem with that. There's actually a problem with that. Um, so if you recall, in Burry's experiment, we had a, a prediction that was a prediction for what would happen if we were able to repeat the process of evolution independently, which is what Burry did. Right? He ran independent populations in his lab. And at the same time, we used the same model. It's a different looking model. It's a coalescent model, but it's fundamentally built on the same assumption as the forward time models of population. But here, we used it for looking among loci. Right? And it is not true that each locus we look at is an entire new replicate of the evolutionary process in the same way that the, sub, the replicate populations were in Burry's experiment. Right? It just isn't. What they are is a replicate process of filtering by Mendelian inheritance through the population pedigree. And we use this model incorrectly in this case, I would say. Fundamentally, conceptually, wrong. But how much of a difference does that make? The point of this slide is just to say, it's got an equation on it. I'm not going to go through it in too much detail. But the point of the slide is that to say that when I make a coalescent model, when someone makes a coalescent model, what they do is formally to average over the population pedigree. And so here's what happens in a coalescent model. You, um, you calculate the probability of coalescence of, in this case, two things sharing an ancestor in the previous generation. And the way that works is that there is a distribution of offspring numbers. Nu i is the number of offspring of individual or gene copy i. And we would calculate for a given set of nu i's um, 
uh, the probability of getting individual i for the first sample and the probability of getting another offspring of individual i for the second sample. And that means that the two things we sampled share a common ancestor in the previous generation, given the news, which are the distribution or the list of offspring numbers. And then what we do is this thing here is take an expectation. And that's the part that's the problem, right? So we now average over the process of reproduction, average over the distribution of offspring numbers. If I had a pedigree in here, the reproductive relationships, the family relationships, we would average over all of the possible family relationships for my two samples, uh, weighted by their probabilities. And we would get the same sort of expression. Over here, a probability of coalescence. And this probability then, because of what we just did, is the same in every generation in the coalescent model. Uh, just to refer back to the effective population size and the, and the distribution of offspring number, here's the variance of the number of offspring per individual, and this is a formula for this kind of model for the effective size. Um, and you can see that it's inversely related to the variance of offspring number. So uh, in, consistent with what I was talking about when I talked about furries. All right. So that's a problem, actually, because we just averaged over the pedigree. And in truth, and we got a probability for every generation, but it's not true. It's just not true. So here is a, um, a small bit of the human uh, pedigree. Uh, and it is part of the Spanish Habsburg um, uh, royal family. And King uh, Charles II who's not shown in this. He would have been three generations below here. And it has a, the paper I'm citing here has a big pedigree of his family. Um, he was the end of the Habsburg uh, royal family because he really, he couldn't function. He could not rule because he was super, super inbred and had a lot of problems as a person. Um, the point I want to make here is uh, that if I took a sample from Mary, you know, one copy of some locus on chromosome 1 and another copy of a locus on chromosome 1 from Philip here, there's zero chance that they have a common ancestor in the previous generation, right? Because they do not share parents. There's zero chance of a common ancestor between those two samples in generation 2 in the past because there are no overlapping parents. All of a sudden, when I get in this picture back to generation three, there's a big chance, right? Because there are two shared uh, great grandparents in this picture. And so the, there would be a chance of common ancestry for those two loci to be descended from a single locus that existed in one of those individuals up there. So we would have zero, zero, something here. Instead of, uh, in the simple right Fisher model, the probability is one over two n. It would say one over two n, one over two n, one over two n. What I want to do next is show you some uh, results of simulations for a diploid two-sex Wright-Fisher model. And that is just a model with uh, complete random mating. That's the Wright-Fisher part. And I am assuming a constant equal sex ratio. So here's a little toy example with three females and three males. And the way the simulations work is I go across the population and pick two parents, one female and one male, one mom and one dad at random, completely uniformly at random from the previous generation. And I do that for some number of generations, potentially a very long number of generations. And then I come to the present day and sample two individuals, take one gene copy from each of them, and follow it back through that pedigree. Right? And they go 50% of the time because of Mendel's laws. Um, they go 50% of the time to the mother, 50% of the time to the father. As I follow these two things back, eventually they'll end up in the same individual. When they end up in the same individual, then it, there's a 50% chance that they're actually the two distinct gene copies in that diploid individual, and a 50% chance that they coalesce in that individual. If they coalesce, I stop and record the generation in which it happened. If they don't, then one goes to the mother, one goes to the father, and I just keep going until I get a coalescence. So the pictures I'll show you on the next slide are generated in this way. Whoops, ah! So uh, simulate 10,000 pedigrees under this model. And then sample one pair of individuals for each of those 10,000 pedigrees. For each of those 10,000 cases, generate a whole lot of coalescent 
by the algorithm I just described. And record for each of those pedigrees and samples uh, the proportion of times that a coalescent event happened in generation one, generation two, all the way three, up to 20 generations into the past. And then make a histogram for each of the uh, generations and uh, display it. <coughs> Here's what happens. Uh, well, maybe let's look over here first. This is what would happen if I simulated the, the discrete Wright Fisher model. In the Wright Fisher model, the way I described it with, um, with uh, a few slides back when I had a 1 over 2n probability of coalescence, then um, I would be drawing numbers, coalescence times, from a geometric distribution with parameter 1 over 2n. So if I do the same simulation I described with the same numbers of replicates and so on and draw times from that distribution, this is the picture I get over here, which is that the probability of coalescence is concentrated on 1 over 2n. That's what the 1 is representing in, in these graphs. So for all generations into the past, it's pretty close to 1 over 2n. And if I look at the actual data with a pedigree, it's very different, at least recent, in the recent past. In the recent past, because I have a large population, there's a very, very small chance that I sample two individuals who are closely related. Right? They wouldn't be sibling of the same parent, for example, very often in a population of 10,000. And so most of the time, for most of those 10,000 pedigrees and samples, there's a zero chance of coalescing for some number of generations back in time. And it, we're waiting, essentially, for backwards in time, waiting for the ancestors of those two individuals to overlap. Because they each have two parents and four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, and their ancestors eventually, pretty quickly actually, will overlap. Yeah. By randomly choosing a mother and randomly choosing a father from a fixed population size, all the way back in time. So what you see happens here is over some number of generations, there's some messy stuff that happens. But then if I zoom back a little bit, not too far back in time, considering um, that it's a population of size 10,000, so the average time to common ancestry should be on the order of 10,000, 2 times 10,000, actually. In, in a relatively brief period of time, there's something very different from the coalescent, but then I converge on something that looks very similar to the basic structure of the Wright Fisher model, which averages over the pedigree, even though I have not done that here. <clears throat> Here's a picture of the same sort of thing that uh, lets you see what happens on a given pedigree. There are five pedigrees in this particular simulation. <clears throat> Here's the probability of coalescence equal to 1 over 2n. <clears throat> and in the early generations, they zoom around, bounce around a lot, and then they all settle down around 1 over 2n after some period of time. And the time that it takes to get to that point here is roughly log base 2 of the population size number of generations. And the reason is that I have 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 ancestors. And so that's roughly the amount of time it takes for my ancestor to, to fill up the population. Same with everybody else in the population. On that time scale, our ancestries all overlap. And then at that time, we settle on this thing that's pretty close to the coalescent prediction. Here's a picture of different population sizes. Previously, I did 10 to the fifth. Um, here I'm doing, which was 100,000. and. Uh, here I'm doing 10 to the third and 10 and just 100. And you can see that the pictures are roughly similar, especially for this one. Here, maybe there's a little more variation than in these other cases. The point of this is if I make the population size smaller and smaller, then the difference in time scale between the log 2 time of the population size and the coalescence time it becomes less and less different. So in a pop very small population, log base 2 of the population size might be comparable to the population size. And then I would not expect uh, the coalescent model to work very well. All right. This thing here is Tajima's D. 
This is a very commonly used test statistic for, for genetic data that is meant to test the basic model of coalescent theory, the standard neutral model. It should have expect, it should be centered around zero and have a certain distribution if the model is true. And the point of doing this now is that the previous slides, they were all about coalescent time, right? And those are not something that we can actually observe. So I wanted to also generate some data and see if you could reject the model, which did show differences in the last graphs, even though I was minimizing them as I described it. Um, but they show differences. But what if I were to take some data instead? And so what I did is to simulate now and calculate Tajima's D and ask whether it was significant. And it really, there's almost no power, at least with a small number of loci, to reject the standard neutral model, even though we've got this conceptual problem that the pedigree is there, and in fact, we averaged over it when we made the model. So this is Tajima's D at 10 independent loci, each with beta equal to one. Remember, that's the mutation parameter. There are two different sample sizes of n equal to 20 and n equal to 100. Um, and instead of just pairwise, which were the pictures I showed you before, or n equal to two. And in the way I did this test, uh, the, the nominal significance is 10%. And you can see that the simulation replicates are all very close to the nominal significance. So that means my power is very, very low, right? I would have hoped, you know, maybe that I would get some power to reject the standard coalescent because again, it's not right. I, did, I made this mistake. We all made this mistake in applying it in this case. Uh, but there's very low power, at least with a relatively small sample of loci. <clears throat> and actually, I, so I did more simulations and it, there really is low power. Um, but I, I say, I'm saying that in this way because I think it could be possible, say, with a huge sample size to detect those signatures that I showed previously but certainly not with a reasonable one. Um, so even though we make this problem in the model of averaging over pedigrees when it's not true, and then applying the model among loci in a genome where all the genome really share the pedigree, there doesn't seem to be much of a problem with it as long as we deal with a very large, well-mixed population. What I want to do now is think about a couple of scenarios that are very different. <coughs> The first one is when there's a, a, a very large family in the pedigree. And so there's this case. There are some individual humans who have had lots of offspring. One of them is Genghis Khan, right? So you can read the literature on this, but you can also look in the genetic papers. There was a previous genetic paper that surveyed people in Central Asia and found that about 8% of everyone had the same Y chromosome haplotype. And also claimed just from family things that they might descend from Genghis Khan. So that's a huge number, right? Eight percent of every of all male, right? This paper here is more recent and did a much more um, intensive sampling across Asia and studied not only this particular individual but a bunch of others who are known to have had lots of kids. Uh, and um, the way that the, the paper goes, they just surveyed Y chromosomes, looked for very, very big haplotypes in frequency, large, large frequency haplotypes, and correlated them with these particular people, one of whom was Genghis Khan. And so I made a toy model based on this and got numbers from this paper. So first of all, um, uh, the way the toy model works is that a single individual male has a very large number of offspring at generation 28 in the past. This is Genghis Khan's time, roughly. <clears throat> the mothers are uh, randomly chosen in the model. The children make up either 8% of the population or 68% of the population. So if you go into some local populations in Central Asia, you can find populations within which they are listed in this paper. There's a 68% of the men have this Y chromosome haplotype. So it's a big number. And then they make also some estimates of the growth rate of the population. And it's about, it's pretty big, 0.3 growth rate per generation. So I put all these things into the simulation model and wondered whether I could see, you know, a signature of this large family in uh, some data. First of all, this is a distribution of the 
pairwise coalescent time in the case where there's 8% of the population is the descendant of this individual. And what you're looking at over here is the far left tail of the distribution. So just going back to generation 28, you do see a bump, right? There's an increased chance of coalescence when I get back to that time when this individual lived. But if you'll notice, the numbers are very small, right? So that's 0 .008 coalescence probability. And you can calculate right here. Um, if I'm following two things backward in time, I have to have the fact that both of them are in the, in the children of um, this toy Genghis Khan. And then um, they both go to Genghis Khan, not to the mothers, and they coalesce, right? So it's 0 .008, roughly, an extra amount of coalescence. And if I look across the entire distribution of coalescence time, instead of just looking over the first 40 generations, looking over a long, long time, and was 10,000 in these simulations. I can't see that at all, right? That 0 .008 extra bit is in this bin right here, and uh, I just can't see it, right? So it's very close to the exponential distribution that I would predict from the coalescent model. But if I have 68% of the population as the children, so here I get a much bigger jump. This is now the whole distribution of coalescence time, which didn't show anything in the other case of 8%. Now I see a big bump in the zero, or the you know very recent coalescence times. There's a lot more very recent coalescence times because I have 68 instead of 8%. And um, so that's noticeable, discernible. If I were to then generate some data, remember I'm not observing coalescence times, I'm observing data. So if I were to generate many, many um, pairwise loci, kind of like in the table I showed earlier in the, in the talk, um, can I reject the coalescent model or the model without uh, this toy example of Genghis Khan? So I generated some data uh, without Genghis Khan and with this particular Genghis Khan. And these are the numbers of pairwise differences or SNPs between two, dif two sequences, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. And you can see that they're not that different, right? They're a little bit different. So Genghis Khan, um, this toy Genghis Khan example has more 0 SNP loci. Right, so said that show no differences, and it's due to this, but it's not as dramatic as the picture here. I might require, I think I calculated this, it takes something like, you know, maybe a thousand loci I could distinguish between those, those two things. I was also interested in, in site frequencies. So site frequencies are, um, if I look at each polymorphic site in a sample larger than two now, and I count the two different bases. And if I put them in bins based on the number of mutant states, that's what this picture here uh, depicts. I made a really big sample for this picture, um, a sample of 1,000. So I'm counting things up from 1 up to 999, the number of mutants in the sample at a polymorphic site. And uh, each of the loci has a theta of 0.5. And I ran two cases, the same two cases, 8% and 16%. Uh, the red are uh, the same simulations without the large family, and the blue are the ones with the large family. So when there's 8%, I don't see a difference between the red and the blue. However, when there's 68%, when uh, the, this individual's children make up 68% of the population, I see the very different pattern, right? Now it's a large sample, but um, the current 1,000 genomes, quote, 1,000 genomes paper that just came out had 5,000 instead of 1,000, um, or no, sorry, 2,500 instead of uh, 1,000. And, and they made some pictures like this. So it's not inconceivable to get some data like this uh, with the current state of genomics. And the pattern is very distinguishable. So I have a dip and a little hump in the site frequency spectrum, and then a tip, a little uh, tail that goes up at the other end. Uh, this one is essentially due to the fact of the coalescent events that happen when I get back to that individual. I'm, a, I'm collapsing a lot of the branches in the coalescent tree, so there's less of an opportunity for particular frequencies to occur in the data. And then this one out here, I can spend a little, well, I'm not going to explain that, but it's essentially the same as what you would see in a migration model, and I'd be happy to talk about why that is uh, after the talk of anyone who's interested.
In any case, the point is with a big data set and looking at some more um, uh, fine-tuned measures of variation, I can actually dis discern these things with great fidelity, actually. All right. I also uh, wanted to show you some simulations of another scenario that could produce something very different <coughs> than the standard population model, and that is a selective sweep. So a selective sweep happens when an uh, advantageous mutant enters the population, it's favored, and it sweeps the fixation within the population because it is selectively advantageous. These are two pedigrees. <coughs> Uh, one that is a neutral pedigree, like the ones I've been showing you. That's the one over here. And then one with a sweep in it. It's very hard. It's impossible to see the sweep. And that sort of gives you a hint of what's coming. Uh, another thing to note is that the selection coefficient here is pretty big. This means that individuals who have one or more copy of this allele big A have, on average, six children instead of people who don't have a copy of Big A, they have on average one child. So if I do the same thing I did with the large families and generate some graphs of coalescence times backward in time, these are sweeps um, in a population for two cases where S is equal to 10 now, really big, and S is equal to 1, also really big. If I estimate S from data in humans, you might estimate for very, very strongly swept loci that it's 1%. So instead of 1%, I've got 1. Um, in both cases, the sweep happened starting in generation 50 in the past. Population size is 10,000. And uh, oh, I should add that here that it's additive selection instead of on the previous slide, it was dominant. dominant. Uh, the allele was dominant. So you can see that when selection is super, super strong, I get a hump in the distribution of coalescence times at around the generation when the allele came in and swept through. But again, if you look at the uh, probabilities, they're kind of on the order of the 8% case for the large family. Right? They're not gigantic. They're a little bigger, but they're not huge. When uh, S is equal to 1, I'm still getting sweeps that go through, but all that's happening is I get a little lump in the distribution of coalescence times. These are you know, the same, this is the same height as this in the two pictures. And you can see here, you know, this is the part, early part, where the probability of coalescence isn't really affected by the structure of the pedigree. This is a little closer view, and, you know, this is the kind of picture that a theoretician would make. The previous graph said, okay, you've got selection coefficients that are out the door, and, um, not much of an invisible effect, but nonetheless, this gives us a little more detail about what's going on in these simulations. And, and what you see here are the sweeps in the case of S equal to 10. Those are the 10 sweeps I now did. And here's the case of S equal to 1. Those are 10 replicate sweeps. So I, in, for this graph, made 10 different populations, each with a sweep, um, which might or might not have gone to completion in this case, but all did here. And here are the coalescent distributions for each of those individual 10 pedigrees. And you can see that in the case of the very strong sweep, um, you get these larger lumps in the distribution. And in the case of the weaker sweep, which still isn't that weak, um, you get these uh, more mild effects. Something to note, I guess, if you're interested, they're color-coded. So that the pedigrees with this pedigree with this sweep correspond to the same color here. And you can see they sort of match up in the case where the sweeps are not uh, coincident. You can't really tell the, the difference between these ones here because they're all lying on the same trajectory. Another thing to note that's just of interest, um, if you're interested in these things, is that the coalescence actually happens way early in the sweep. Right? It doesn't happen during this very fast part of the sweep, but it happens closer to generation 50 in the past. Um, and here, the same thing is true. These are shifted over to when the alleles were in low frequency because it's kind of like a bottleneck. If I go backward in time, I get to that sweep, and all of a sudden, the population is getting very small. And so I have to coalesce faster at that point. But because this is happening in a pedigree, I have a big chance of not being affected by that sweep, just sort of jumping over it and going off into some other individual who doesn't necessarily have the swept allele. All right, so that's more of theoretical interest. 
The last thing, uh, how much time do I have here? It was about 15 minutes, roughly. Yep, that thing never got started. <clears throat> the last thing I want to talk about is population subdivision and migration. And in contrast to the two previous uh, cases of the large family and the selective fleet, here there's more of a concern that the coalescent models need to be adjusted to account for pedigrees, or at least there is some benefit to doing that and some consequence uh, to not doing that. So the conclusions of this last part are that these events, like demographic events in a large, well-mixed population, a large family or a selective suite, they have to be very dramatic in order to um, give a signature in the data. Nonetheless, maybe with large samples, we can pick them up with things like site treatment. So here's a picture of a pedigree in the two population model, a case of two subpopulations or deems, so-called, that share migrants at some rate. So within each of these subpopulations are the kind of pedigree that I've been simulating. And then they're connected by individuals who actually move, right? So that means this person's parent was actually in the other population, and so on. And these are for a particular migration rate. This is the probability of movement of an individual per generation. And this is the total population size of the subpopulation. And in this case, the number, total number of individuals that moves out of a population is equal to 0.2 per generation. And this is a simulated pedigree with those, with those parameters. So what I want to do now is compare this sort of thing oops, sorry, <clears throat> to a coalescent model that actually has migration in it. So the previous coalescent model was a single population model. It's possible also to develop coalescent models that account for migration and subdivision. And here's a little example of one of them. Uh, the way this happens is why now I have to keep track of where things are. And if the population is just two subpopulations and I take two samples, then those two samples could be either in the same subpopulation or in different subpopulations, or they can have coalesced. Right? And those are these three states here. Bit same population, different populations, coalesced. And then this would be the same population, diff different population, coalesced. And that matrix there is the rate matrix in this coalescent model for movement among those states. I can take that rate matrix and make a prediction for the distribution of the time to coalescence for a sample. This TB means T between. That means starting in the state of being in different populations. I'm waiting until a coalescence. And I can calculate the, the distribution of that from this matrix here, like so. I won't go into that, but I'd be happy to talk about how that works. And here's a picture of it, uh, just a stylized picture of the kind of thing you would get for, for a migration rate. So basically speaking, it's not the exponential distribution we saw before, but it's, it's got some little delay. I have to wait until the samples get into the same population before they can coalesce. So I want to compare that kind of prediction to what happens when I simulate pedigrees and coalesce through pedigrees in this pop, sub pop, subdivided population model. So here's a, a picture. Uh, of two different simulations that differ in the rate of migration. So NM equal to 0 0.01 or NM equal to 0.1. In both cases, the subpopulation size is 100. And the predictions that I referred to on the previous slide are given by these curves. A single population pedigree is generated for each of these pictures. And what you see is the actual distribution for that pedigree of the, of the time to coalescence for a sample between, from two different subpopulations. These also um, have a recent pedigree, which has nothing funny in it that would give the kind of patterns uh, like a migration. No, it doesn't have a recent migration event in it, uh, for example. And the reason that's important will become clear in a second. Uh, in any case, the point of this graph is that when NM is really small, the prediction of the coalescent model with migration is terrible for what goes on in a pedigree. It is way, way off. And what you can see along the horizontal axis in both of these graphs are actual migration events in the pedigree. Right? And you can see that when the migration rate is really low, 
then it, coalescent events between populations happen sort of associated with burst or clumpy uh, migration events that happen if they happen over a few generations, I get a little clump of migration events. So all the loci can travel across between the populations there as they go backward in time. Um, and that leads to this very choppy distribution uh, associated, which would be different. If I simulated this again for a different pedigree, I would have different migration events, I had a different distribution for, the, for this uh, coalescent. If I turn up the migration rate a little bit to something a little uh, higher, like 0.1 or bigger, then the prediction of the standard coalescent model, which averages over pedigrees, is okay, right? It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. A lot better than up here. Right? Nonetheless, um, even though this is true, what I have done here is not allow something to happen, which could happen, and that is that there could be a recent migrant. So here's a graph that shows five of those um, for that second case on the bottom of the previous slide, five pedigrees. Four of them have the, a recent pedigree of the sample. So these are supposed to represent the two individuals I sampled between the two populations and the fact that there's no migrant in their recent ancestry. In this case, it happened that there was a grandparent who was a migrant. When there's a grandparent who's a migrant, then if I follow loci back from this individual, there's a chance that they end up over here. And so this is a case in which I could be fooled. Some portion of the time, it's as if the locus actually came, that I sampled from this population, actually came from the other population. And so I get a very different distribution. One that might look closer to the standard coalescent exponential distribution that I showed uh, uh, way back in the beginning of this talk. You can use a kind of a, an idea of mixtures uh, to make predictions about situations like that. So if I know the recent ancestry of the sample, and I know that an individual's great-grandparent or whatever it is, in this, in this particular graph, grandparent, was a migrant, then I can calculate the probabilities of this thing being a migrant. So I take one sample from there, it has to have a half chance to go here, another half that it came from that particular grandparent. So a quarter chance that a locus in that individual came from the other population. And so it would look more like a sample from a few things from within the population, right? So if I show uh, TW, that's the prediction for a sample within, TB, the prediction for a sample between, and a mixture of those two according to the chance that a locus ends up in that migrant quarter of the time TW and three quarters of the time TB, that mixture really fits pretty well. So I can generate a good prediction if I were to know the recent pedigree and any sort of funny business that happened in it. Here's a graph that just shows a number of different cases of that same sort of thing, showing that the predictions actually um, of these mixtures are pretty close to, again, this is these are data trajectories simulated on just one pedigree, right? And so they're pretty close to these predictions. All right, so the notion now is, okay, if I were to sample an individual who had a migrant ancestor, and I wanted to do something that people do a lot in population genetics, which is to estimate the migration parameter and, and the mutation parameter, theta and m in my notation. Some of the time, those samples would actually have come from the other population. Right? So I might get a very poor estimate of the migration rate. And if I have a poor estimate of the migration rate, I might also have a poor estimate of theta, the mutation parameter. So we wanted to correct for that. And the basic notion is to use likelihoods. So if I'm thinking about the likelihood of the entire data, I could condition on the pedigree. It's an average over all pedigrees. And if I want to condition further, given a pedigree, on the recent ancestry, so the configuration that would occur if I follow back just through the recent part of the pedigree, just like I was talking about before. So here's some examples. If I had this particular recent pedigree for a sample of four individuals where I've taken both of their chromosomes, then I would have these proportions 
of uh, these different configurations. So this one here is that everyone is just the way I sampled them, right? So these ones ended up here, and these ones ended up here. This is the case of, that we've been dwelling on already, that the locus ended up here, and then that has this frequency. Um, there's also, in this particular recent pedigree, there's a shared grandparent, right? So there's a chance that a locus from that individual and a, lo a locus from this individual have a common ancestor at that point. And I've denoted that with this IBD, or identical by descent, um, in this picture. So the idea is to make inferences now um, based on the recent pedigree, on the pedigree, uh, and trying to estimate these kinds of proportions, and also estimate, I haven't drawn them in here, but there's parameters m and theta also in the likelihood. So what we did to do this is simulate two deems, each of constant size n, a migration rate of m over 2 per lineage, just like in that coalescent model, but now in a pedigree, and the mutation rate of theta over 2 per lineage, and here's the definitions of those things in terms of the parameters of the exact model, infinitely many mutation, infinitely many sites um, mutation uh, without recombination within, within the loci. And then an inference method assumes the same model as above and does numerical computations of likelihood based on a dynamical programming approach that I will not describe, but I can talk to you about if you're interested. And then I want to maximize over M and theta and the recent sample pedigree. In fact, those configurations that uh, might or might not look like the actual sampling configurations, but I can know um, if I were to know the pedigree. Here I don't know them. I don't know the pedigree, I'm actually going to estimate them based on likelihood. Here's a picture <clears throat> of what happened when we simulated 100 different pedigrees with um, n equal to 1,000 per subpopulation. Theta is equal to 1 or 2, and m is equal to 0.2 or 2. So there are two different cases of theta and m. And uh, always the population size is 1,000. It's a sample of four, so it's two individuals taking both of their chromosomes. And there were three different population pedigrees, recent population pedigrees for the sample, which are depicted here. Either there was a grandparent who was a migrant, a great grandparent who was a migrant, or nothing, uh, nothing in the recent pedigree that would shift the sample from what I actually took. The blue, uh, blue-ish, I guess those are blue. I'm a little colorblind. So um, uh, these are, the, the blue ones are um, estimates that just use the coalescent model without taking into account pedigree. What I would normally do in a coalescent, uh, application of a coalescent to these data. So I'm estimating, uh, regardless of the pedigree, using a model that has averaged over the pedigree. The orange dots, are for um, the same data generated on these pedigrees, the routine that the likelihood method that actually accounts for the pedigree by estimating these configurations of the sample. <clears throat> the true values, which are you can read here, but they're denoted in the picture by these open circles. The means among the 100 pedigrees are given by these two lines, so the mean for theta and the mean, sorry, the mean for m, and the mean for theta for these two cases. And what you can see, I'm pointing at this one because it's the most dramatic, here if I don't account for the pedigree, I get some pretty bad estimates if a grandparent was a migrant. It's not too surprising, right? Because there, there's a big chance. I have both of the chromosomes with this in individual. One had to come from here. So there's a half chance that that chromosome came from the other part. Correcting, um, I get estimates that are very close. The bias is gone, and um, maybe there's a little less variance in this case. So you can see, overall, um, doing this correcting helps quite a bit, right? And it helps when there is something in the recent pedigree that is very different than the predictions of, this, of the coalescent model with migration that has no pedigree in it, has constant rates for every generation. 
one thing to note, I guess here you can see something that is going on. The, is, there's greater variance in the estimates uh, when there's no pedigree um, effect. And that's basically because we've got an extra parameter. You know, we got the pedigree, and so we've got a greater spread in the estimates, a little bit greater. All right, so I want to end. Um, this is an encouraging result, a kind of a proof of principle. I haven't, I haven't actually, um, we have not applied this to data yet. So all we've done is simulate some pedigrees for a two-population case and show that correcting for the recent structure of the ancestry of the individuals who are sampled helps a lot when you're doing inference. And that ignoring it can sometimes not be very good, right? So I just said, you know, that conclusion I just said, but going back a few slides, um, there actually is a huge difference between the pedigree results when the migration rate is very small and the results for pedigrees and the results for the standard coalescent models with average over pedigree. And that means that when migration rates are small, it's not just this log phase two time scale that's important for pedigrees anymore. Those migration events that happen, they are fixed for all loci. They might be very spread out in time. And so all loci are restricted to ha uh, take those paths in the pedigree to get from one population to the next. In the standard model, when I run it for different loci, I remember I'm running as if I'm doing evolution all over again. So each locus has an independent migration process, which is not true. Right? And it shows up a lot when migration rates are really small. Another point is that using a mixture idea, just if I were to know the pedigree, let's say I could estimate that, then I can use a mixture model together with the results of the coalescent model with migration to make good predictions for what happens on a pedigree. All right. And that is all I had to say. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer questions. That's a good question. I don't know. So we haven't um, haven't dealt with with recombination at all yet in these models. So all of these uh, simulations were done with a single locus at a time, without um, any recombination. I I would suspect it wouldn't you wouldn't be able to take it back too many generations because. The chance of ending up, when I have a pedigree that has events in it that are longer ago than you know five, six, seven generations ago, there's so many ancestors at, at that point. So if I had a migration event, there's a very small chance that I observed a uh, locus going there. So there's a small chance of picking up, I think, a large segment that would be IBD between populations, for example. But it's a good question, and I think that's one of the directions that I'd like to go, you know, to think about haplotype structure and flocks of IBD in these kinds of models with pedigree. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I think it, it would certainly be possible, but I, I would be, um, I wouldn't be surprised if the effect was very uh, negligible, because the, like the results that I showed for a selective sweep, they had a really strong selection, and it was very difficult to pick up anything. They show some kind of extra coalescence during a sweep, but the fact that that one locus is causing individuals to have more offspring, on average, it's also true that that locus is moving around the population. And everyone has another parent that might or might not have the allele. So there's a good chance of escaping the signature of that sweep 
when you're looking at loci that are unlinked to the locus on, that's under select. All of those simulations for the selective sweep, it was the effect just from the pedigree on unlinked loci, which you would never expect in a regular sort of modeling coalescence. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the simulations that I showed early on of a single uh, well-mixed population, the signature of the pedigree, the difference between the pedigree and the coalescent predictions is greater when the population size is smaller. So in cases when, in which there was a bottleneck that was pretty severe, you might expect to see some signature of the pedigree. Yeah, I wouldn't. I guess I wouldn't expect because the um, if the population size is reasonably big, those I would expect to have the same kind of effect that they would have in a normal population genetic model that averages over pedigree. You get something like the harmonic mean, and it would just be on the pedigree instead of uh, independently each generation. So, yeah. Other questions? Come on, somebody. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat>